All right. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, Liam. Oh, a big round of applause. <laughs> Shane, well, <laughs> I don't know. How, oh, that is dreadful. That's the worst experience I have ever had. Christine Lernans, thank you so much. Oh, I'm so thrilled that we got that going. I don't know how. And as I say, I really don't know what what caused all those problems, but we're just so relieved that we fixed that. Thank you so much. Right. Yeah, Let's, very happy. Oh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> about wasting half of your day sitting on the line in Nelson. Now, so tell me, Christine, uh, this book, uh, uh, you know, a great read and and written at a very, you know, it, it's set in a very interesting time in our history, isn't it? A very t- tumultuous time for our country. Yes, I find that the um, 1980s actually are, is a very important um, period because you have to understand the 70s and the 80s to understand a lot about what's happening today, um, I feel. So, so mm. much that um, is going on in the world today, you can trace back to a time in history, you know, where people were actually, so many people were wanting a more sustainable world, a more inclusive world, you know, with the whole, um, the whole green movement, the sustainable movement that was with the hippies at the time. And, right. and of course, the anti-nuke, the anti-nuclear stance, which was so important, and um, you know, New Zealand stood up for that. Other countries, you know, took different directions, and now, you know, here we are having nuclear threats again. You know, between Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So it was it was a brave and bold little country back then, I think, and and we were pioneers. I, I'm proud of how we stood up to to that threat and and under the Longy uh, de- era and. And so this book is, is going to be interesting in, in lots of levels. And I haven't even mentioned the title because I'm so flustered by all the phone call <laughs> problems. But it's, it's called In Amber's Wake. And uh, this is Christine's, uh, is, it your, is it your fourth novel? Fourth. fourth. Yeah. yeah, the uh-huh. fourth one. Yeah, and, um, and, 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 and I guess it's, it's quite a departure in a way for you, do you think, the this, this subject matter? Because it, it is, it is quite, quite a romantic story, isn't it? Yeah, so um, it is a, a romantic story, and it's it's a, a bit of a love triangle. So there's the three families. It's a little bit of a saga on the three families. The you know the family that's in Cambridge, who um, breed horses, and then there's the family you know the wealthier family, the Reeds, who came over from the UK and settled in Auckland, who are an investment, and then there's the Greek family who were in Ponsonby before Ponsonby was you know quite upmarket as it is today and his father was a plumber and he, he was you know wanting to become a filmmaker so it's a, those two um really hit it off the two young characters but amber goes for the older man <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> i noticed this and ethan ethan's already sort of fallen for her but uh, he realizes that he he's there this this older chap he's quite a bit older too isn't he yes so he's in his young 50s and um, he just can't believe it. He, he says he could handle it if she had gone for someone, you know, his age or, you know, someone who he felt would be competition. But, you know, he just can't take the rejection, you know, not, not going for him, but to go for Stuart instead. I, all the more he sees Stuart as more of a businessman. Mm. And it, it infuriates him that Stuart has a yacht and that because she's, you know, <laughs> doing these protests, you know, against the, you know, the nuclear protests that it's just as convenient that he lends his yacht for that. So he finds that Stuart isn't, you know, genuinely interested, you know, in the anti-nuclear stance or, mm. you know, the whole green movement. And this is just convenient to give the yacht and to, you know, make a good impression on her. Yes, and it's great because it's really believable. The characters are really believable. And we all, we all I mean, I was sort of smitten with that whole uh, Nambasa Sweetwaters uh, phase, you know, when I was y- younger. And, and I think, I think, uh, this is it's really a, a really evocative part of, of the book you know the the nudie hippie you know um, dopes being you know, setting. A, lot of, a lot of youngsters in New Zealand were really buying into that at the time uh, yeah uh, pretty much worldwide because in Europe uh, um, in North America everywhere it was just really a, a massive movement and it just happened like that and what's what I find so odd about it it was so so powerful and and then somehow it just faded you know, it was another way of life, an alternative way of life, and there were all kinds of different thoughts, you know, at the time, even, you know, not to have doors, to have beads, because, you know, you could flow, and then if the family has a quarrel, you're not slamming doors in each other's faces, you know, it's more... It was all peace, just, peace, love, and mung beans, wasn't it, really? 
Yeah, it was. And then um, just as it came, you know, and so powerful, then it ended up just fading away. And then, um, you know, here we are today. I sometimes hear, you know, some young people saying, you know, as if the green movement was, you know, very new to today. Mm. But actually, it's not. There were a lot of people who really um, gave their life, like the Greenpeace people, you know, invested everything to try to change, you know, the direction the world was taking. And they didn't know anything about the global heating you know, at the time, yes. they just felt that um, we were going in the wrong direction and everything was becoming too industrialized. And, yes. Um, you know, the pollution, that was bad enough. Yeah, that's right. And uh, But just getting back to the, the whole nostalgia thing, because it's, it's, it's really engaging, like, for example, when there's a scene in the book um, when Ethan and Amber are sort of courting, as it were, and they have these phone calls and the little sister gets on the line and listens in, because that was a real issue <laughs> for the young people in, at, at that time, because nothing was private, and you were slinking away in the hallway trying to talk to your boyfriend, and <laughs> other members of the family yeah. could, could listen in. It was dreadful. No privacy. Yes, and what I really loved, what I did with Caging Skies, which was, you know, during the World War II, I found that life changes and then people forget all these little things of how people used to live. And I really wanted to capture that because it was just a nightmare. You want to talk to someone, you know, really in a private way and say all the things. And you have all these ears, you know, people just pick up the other phone quietly. They can listen in. You can't even find a place. You know, it's not like today you can just walk out with your mobile or you can just text and no one, you know, young people have their um, privacy like that. Mm. It's just, uh, it was a different world back then. And then you had all the problem with the coins. You know, you had to have enough coins. <laughs> so even when you make a phone call, if it's someone else who picks up and you're waiting, you're watching all your coins just go down the drain like that. Yeah, right. I mean, there's so, so you're spot on with so many things. But uh, like, I'm wondering how, how, you know, you're of Belgian and Italian descent and, and, you know, you've really got the Kiwiisms. You know, the Kiwiana down down pat. I think. You know, when 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 uh, Ethan talks about uh, she went absolutely ape. I mean, we used to use that say, that phrase ourselves. Yeah. So what I did um, for a lot of the research to make it very authentic. When we came to New Zealand, we made friends who were our age, and they would, you know, just tell us because I was curious how were things, you know, what it used to be like and. So I learned a lot like that, but a lot of that I had to actually just research what, what were the sayings. Um, I would look back at old, you know, newspapers at the time and just a lot of, um, a lot of things. And I find that people are able through our stories. That's why it's so interesting because though I'm the author and I'm the one who wrote this book, in fact, a lot of the material I have is just from what I hear and other people telling about the story. So, for example, the phone cradling, how people used to be able to make free phone calls from um, pay phones by tapping on you know, the receiver like that. I don't know if you ever did that. Some, a lot of people didn't know about that, but I have some sneaky friends who used to make <laughs> free phone calls around New Zealand. And, you know, so no, we didn't. I didn't that. know that, but we would have if we did. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so some people knew of it, and only, only zero you had to dial the normal way, but the other numbers you could tap, and a lot of people knew that, and used to, you know, go, never have to have a coin <laughs> in their pocket through it. So I picked up all these charming details, even the Carlos days, I thought that was incredible. I know. You know, that you had to have the just, you know, one day of the week where you weren't supposed to, but other people who had two cars, well, they could have two stickers. Yeah, that's right. It, it was it was a time and a place, and and it's funny because I, I've forgotten some of these things. So you're right. It, it'll be it'll be really nice for people, I think, to relive uh, uh, this this time. And you know, Rainbow Warrior, what a what a powerful uh, story to have intertwined, you know, into this love story. And and you personally, how did how did that impact on you? What what was your perception of that that whole um, uh, tragedy? Oh, it was just. Horrific. I remember when I heard it. So I was actually in France when the news came to me. And that's why I actually lived it over there. And then when I came to New Zealand, you know, I, I experienced how it was felt over here from people. So I actually had the, the feelings of people from both sides. But um, people were completely shocked over there. Now, I know some of the newspapers, it depends what newspapers. So it was actually French newspapers who... Um, who went to expose a lot of uh, the truth that had happened. They were the ones, you know, who uh, pointed a lot of fingers. But you had other magazines and things who were trying to make it seem at the time as if 
almost rainbow warrior warrior had something that was aggressive <laughs> you know right and that, uh, yeah. it was just insane you know some of the some of the some of the writing um, i would say yeah yeah some of the writing that came out but the french were particularly sarcastic with the french mm -hmm. so for example the person tico he was the one who was supposed to do the investigation and it's really a tragic story because he was so trusted because he was the one who spoke out and said that france should get out of algeria he was always very brave mm. and what is, is believed now is that actually the people at the top lied to him but they used him because they said if he says you know that that they weren't involved the french people are going to believe him because he was such a trusted figure right and the scandal was so huge against him the way the french made fun you know he had a beard and they said like he's fabricating stories and they would show his beard going into you know mm -hmm. being knit into something i mean it was just humiliating and actually his daughter um jumped out a fourth story of an apartment building in paris she was so humiliated by this incredible so that was just another mm -hmm. yeah it's just another, another just chapter very, very very tragic and sad, yes. It was. And, I, you know, I remember covering this as a, a young journo and, and hearing about the, the Rainbow Warrior bombing and I was working in a newsroom in, at Radio New Zealand at the time and I was one of the first, I was kind of there at five in the morning uh, just a few hours after it had happened. And, and it just didn't seem real that this was going on, uh, you know, on our doorstep. And when, you know, everyone thought it was an accident. And so when, when the truth came out, it was... It was outrage and disgust and, and total shock, you know, this attack. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. But I read, um, it was Michael King who wrote a book, The Death of the Rainbow Warrior. And it's something I recommend for anyone interested in this period because it's so, so interesting. Mm. The way he actually explains it from the French coming into New Zealand. And a lot of the things that they had assumed, the way it would be in France, it was completely the opposite in New Zealand. So, for example, in France, it's someone would just go to a beach where there's no one around. Mm -hmm. No one would really notice them or pay attention. But in New Zealand, you know, everyone is small. And who are these people? What are they doing? <laughs> you know, people look yeah. at yeah it's uh, yeah it's 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 a great it's a great subject to to put in into a book and you know you don't shy away from things like i mean the springbok tour as well very um divisive time you know some people would say even more divisive than the pandemic has been in a, in a way in our country and and so this is almost like it's like a history lesson within a within a story when when you said about you know writing it did you did you think that is it was this all kind of planned or did it did it evolve um, I did have some of the major events I wanted to bring in because I find that when in the fabric of a story I actually interweave what's really happening, that just meets how we experience life as people. Because as we go about our daily life, we have everything that we're doing and our feelings and our relationships, our family and things like that. But we don't live, you know, in some kind of... Um, isolation in a bubble the truth is we also are part of what's going on at the time so this was very important at the time and the discussions are like come about around the table you know when these are really seismic events and it would have been impossible to you know talk about that era and then not bring into the family how people are reacting for example on the on the spring box tours um, and that's how it is today. A lot of what we experience, even just recently with um, people who are getting vaccinated and other people who don't want to be vaccinated. Well, not only does that happen, you know, outdoors, but that happens right in the family. You know, there's lots of cases now where one member of the family won't want, doesn't, didn't want to be vaccinated. Now the other member of the family yeah. doesn't want them to come over. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it's. So, it's yeah. been tough. It's been tough, and it's 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 divided people. But this, I mean, this book. It sounds like a, you know, I'd recommend it as a, as a satisfying read. But there's a, there's an interesting end which I won't give away. But um, you know, it always amazes me how authors can you know pull off these twists and turns. And and you've you've done it brilliantly. Are you? Would you say this is a a, a book that would appeal more to young adults, or what's your perception of it? Who who would enjoy it the most? Well, I think young people would in, definitely enjoy it because they'd learn a lot. Um, I, some of my um, son's friends did, knew nothing about Carlos Days. When I said that, they said, oh, come on, that's not true. Mm. And they had to actually look it up online because they wouldn't believe it. So I think young people, but I also think people who went through the era themselves and forgot a lot of things, actually they, they relive it and they say, oh, I had forgotten about this. 
um, because there was a lot of um, things that I I went back and I just managed to find little things, even the price of bread. You know, so, sometimes people put weird things online, so they'll just pop up an advert of what the bread was on special. You know, at the time, so yes. I would just take that to the date and then <laughs> put that in. Okay. I, well, I I, th- yeah. I I think uh, I think you've done it done it amazingly, and of course you're um you're coming to the Queenstown Writers Festival, and you will be giving a, a talk, won't you, during that as well, so people can ask you questions about in Amber's Wake. Yes, yes. And so I'm very much looking forward. Is to this that. your first trip? Have you been uh, to Queenstown before, Christine? No, the furthest we went down was Franz Josef Glacier. Oh, so, uh, very good. And I'm probably pronouncing that in the European way, Franz Josef. <laughs> Franz Josef. Yeah, sorry. I prefer, um, I prefer yeah, that so pronunciation that, just quietly. I think it sounds beautiful the way you say it. <laughs> but that was one of our first trips and we went that, you know, that far down. But we had always meant to come further down. But, um, you know, with three kids going from Nelson, that was about enough before we turned back up. So mm-hmm. very, very excited. Oh, I think it's I think it's wonderful that, that you're coming here, and I'm so pleased that the festival is just getting bigger and bigger and growing. And uh, it's it's always a core group of people that, that make it happen. And also hear that you're off to uh, to Southland. Are, are you in Southland at the moment? No, you're heading there soon. Yeah, no, yeah. So I'm heading there today. In just a couple hours, I head to Southland. Yeah, to Infracargo. So mm. that will be the furthest south I've ever been. <laughs> well, you get next, well, next step, Stewart Island or, or Antarctica. <laughs> absolutely, that's right. Which, of course, is mentioned in the book Antarctica, but you haven't actually got there yourself yet. No, no. Um, I, I was a bit curious to go down there. My husband says mm. <laughs> he's a little afraid, but I said, "Come on, one day we've got to. We're this close." Yes. But, uh, Would you consider yourself an adventurous person? Um. I'm probably more adventurous in my writing, yeah. <laughs> so I am a bit adventurous, but I would be, you know, I would have all these concerns, for example, I would love to see Antarctica, and at the same time, I'd probably say, oh no, <laughs> Yes, like all <laughs> you know, the- that is far away and- so far away and so such a brutal landscape and and I, th- I you know the thing that's weird for me is I think that feeling of kind of aloneness and being in that in that it would be incredible but I think people are quite brave who go there and I think people who live there are are incredible yeah I find that too because I thought to myself you know that there's no hospital there if suddenly somebody's got something that's right you know, and then you think okay if you have if you have chilled rains in this weather in Nelson in winter, <laughs> what, are you going to get frostbite? <laughs> exactly. So, of course, it's well heated at Scott Base, I'm sure. I've only heard good about it then, oh, um, it, from it, the people, you know, that I interviewed. I'm sure that I'm sure that you'll get there and probably think it's you know it's probably a life changing thing to do. Uh, but I know that we're we're really happy that that you are coming to to Queenstown in November, and uh, I recommend that people read this book in Amber's wake. And we are going to be giving away a copy um, after one o'clock, uh, Christine, which will which will be great. So it's nice to nice to share this so uh and and we can't stop the interview without a, a quick chat about um you know of course jojo rabbit when uh, which is which of course was influenced by caging skies when when you wrote that book did you know you had something super special um probably not because today i look back i think that was an incredible act of you know faith to take the years it took to, to start writing that in mm. a museum it was where my husband was working Mm -hmm. and I still remember um, we take our bicycles go to the museum together and we bring a Tupperware of rice for lunch you know and put squirt some mayonnaise on it you know so it would be more (laughs) filling for us you know because he had a museum a museum salary and you know I was writing with no funding on this so it was really um, but I felt that it was very important to to record this period of history because I, I even remember more than ever now, you know, because so many of the last people of this generation are passing away. I had one friend, she's 102 years old now, right? and um, I'm, she was, you know, there and a young woman in this period, and she was a Holocaust survivor, and I'm always, you know, so happy every year she's still there, but I think she won't be there forever, and there won't be that whole generation that you can talk to about this period anymore yes. when you have questions. 
Mm. So th- that's why even for the 80s, I wanted to grasp that because I'm conscious now that 10 years go by and then another 10 years and then there's less and less people who actually remember the era and everyone will just think email and, you know, sending texts and mm-hmm. Mm. whatever by then technology mm. will have changed, you know, things. Well, I'm so glad that, I mean, uh, obviously we had dreadful difficulties with phones today, but I loved it when you said you had a landline as well because I still, <laughs> have, I still have a landline and... Uh, you know, I, I still um, I still enjoy talking on that because uh, I get really fed up with, with being tied to my phone and, you know, uh, so so it's interesting, isn't it? So thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've hit news time, but I, I thank you uh, firstly for, for your great oh, writing. Thank you so much, Leanne, too, yeah. for having me. It's been lovely to speak to you. Yes, I've really enjoyed it, Christine, and thank you for your patience as well. And a lot of people texting in <laughs> saying they would like to get this book. So I, I think, uh, you know, all the best with it. And we look forward to catching up in Queenstown. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.